Thank you, Brother Ryan. I'm going to uh, invite my uh, young participants to come and join me this morning. They get the pleasure or the, I don't know, the agony of hanging. Ladies, come on down here. Uh, we're going to do a little kids' time this morning, okay? Is that all right? Are you excited? Yeah, you look excited. Those smiles just really are awesome. It's good to see you. Are you missing church a little bit? Are you missing all your church buddies? Yes, I am too. I don't even know half my church buddies yet because we just moved here, you know, but we're missing them too, exactly. So anyway, I wanted to take just a minute and because I know you guys have a new dog, right? Yeah. Yes, and have you, you've named your dog. What's your dog's name? Tobias. Tobias or Toby, right? Yeah, and is he a good boy? A boy, he's a boy. Most of the time, he doesn't ever get in trouble. Has he started chewing on stuff yet? Yes. Yes. Has he started chewing on you yet? Yes. Yes. Their, their, she, no, their teeth are sharp, aren't they? Yeah, they got those really sharp puppy teeth. Anyway, he's growing though, isn't he? Yeah. Well, the reason I'm asking you about Toby is because I want to talk with you for just a second about dogs because I love dogs. And uh, uh, I've had dogs for most of my life growing up and especially as a little boy. And one of the things that I learned about dogs is that uh, they, um, sometimes people actually will abuse them. Sometimes people abuse dogs. You know how they abuse them? They abuse them by maybe hitting them. And here's how you can tell. Now, don't ever just walk up to some dog that you don't know and stick your hand out, okay? Promise me you won't do that. You promise? You promise, Rachel? Okay, all right. So don't just stick your hand out to some random dog. But uh, a dog that's been maybe hurt or been hit in the past, when you, when you come up to like its head like that, it's going to flinch. And do you know why it flinches? Why does it flinch? It's scared. It's been, and it's, it's been hit before. When it's, it's had that experience of someone with the hand, but it was... It hurt. That would hurt. Should we try that to see if that hurts? No. no, not really. No. Okay, no, we won't do that. But anyway, so uh, one of the ways that we can help dogs who have been abused, and many dogs are abused, unfortunately, and a lot of them are in dog pounds and need to be adopted, right? One of the ways that we can do that is by not raising our hand to them, but extending carefully our hand out to them slowly let them come to us and l maybe if we had a little treat in our hand that would help do you ever do you ever put your hand out like this to Toby yeah. what does he do Licks he likes to lick your hand doesn't he mm -hmm. and what does he do if you put a treat in your hand <laughs> he gobbles it right up doesn't he and, sometimes he bites you, right? and nips you a little bit not really bites you though he's just playing right yeah. yeah okay but see that's the thing if you will uh, if you will treat those dogs that have been hurt uh, kind of that way, eventually, eventually, they will stop remembering the times that they were hit. And they will see the hand as not something to fear, but something that's a good thing. But for it's going to take a while to do that. It takes a long time to not remember things. Now, I want to tell you something. The reason I'm telling you this is because, now this is going to really shock you, but there are times when people are abusive to other people. Yeah. There are times when, when they are hit, you know, and when they are uh, spoken to in just hateful ways. And, and they are just made to feel as if they are just totally worthless. And oftentimes, here's what's really sad, is that, unfortunately, sometimes this happens in churches where Christians to other Christians treat each other in really, really bad ways. That's bad, isn't it? It is, yeah. So w when we see that or when we find ourselves in those situations, one of the things that we're going to talk about in church in just a minute when, when I talk in, in my sermon is how that one of the gifts that God's given us, hope, enables us to be able to reach out to even people who have been hurt 
and to extend our hand out to them, not a hand, but how to treat them, even though initially they may be, they may not, they may not like it, they may not appreciate it, they still might not love us back, and yet we still go ahead and we love them in spite of that. Okay? So, you're going to take good care of Toby? Yeah. He's going to live a long time, isn't he? Yeah. I hope so. I hope he's a great pet for you guys. But make sure that you love on him, okay? Love on him and, and make him feel really special. And he'll be a great friend for a long time. All right? Thank you. You can go back to your seats now. And cats are, Peyton says cats are too. This has not been a part of my life experience yet. And Lord willing, no, I won't say that. Um, I, I, we were talking about that before service started. And we have some, we definitely have some cat people in this room this morning. In fact, as a, as an official dog person, I feel a little bit outnumbered. And so I'm going to have to tread very carefully. Good morning, church. It's good to be able to be with you. And I know you just, uh, if you're watching at home, you just saw a cool video from some of the people in the church who sent some videos to Brother Ryan, and, and he put those all together, and we've added to that. So if you, hopefully you saw some new faces in that if you've already seen it. I am still enjoying the beautiful faces that I see that uh, greet me, greet us as we gather this morning. Uh, we appreciate all of the efforts that you are doing to make us feel welcome and at home and, and able to deal with this stuff that we're dealing. It is, it is a great thing. Uh, I would invite you this morning to, uh, to take out the... Uh, the outline that you should have found online this morning to help you with what we're going to be talking about. And if you'll bear with me, I want to just kind of build a little bit on where we, where we left off last Sunday by reminding you of some key teaching that we shared last week about the subject of hope. You'll remember we, we said that we're continuing to focus on hope because it is uh, so much connected to the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at that as we look at the book of First Peter uh, until uh, the end of May. And then we will transition into uh, another thought about Pentecost. Some key points from last week, though, let me share with you. What we learned is that biblical hope is irrevocably linked to the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So having a clear understanding about the bodily resurrection of Jesus is key to us understanding biblical hope. We learned that now we hope or we wait to receive our incorruptible bodies, which are being safeguarded in heaven until Jesus comes with them. Hope provides a rock solid, and this is really where we're going to pick up today. Hope then provides a rock solid foundation that enables us to fearlessly follow the Spirit's leading. Where the Holy Spirit is leading us, we need to have the ability to follow because as we learned last week, some of the places where God's Spirit is going to be leading us are not necessarily places that we would choose to go ourselves. Uh, we've discovered that it might bring persecution or suffering or hardship in some kind of way. Now, with this truth understood, we got that in our minds. Hope is associated with, with the resurrection of Jesus, and it empowers us. It gives us a rock-solid foundation. With that truth understood, Peter then, in the book of 1 Peter, begins to direct his hearers into ways that hope, this hope of the resurrection, translates into kingdom activity or kingdom life. And the first one he's going to, to mention is one that I know you're going to enjoy this morning. It is love. It enables us to act and to, to move into great ways with love. Before we get into how that all works, let me share just a little bit of the backstory. We haven't spent too much time talking about the backstory or some of the, the uh, situational things that were going on in the world when Peter wrote this book. The backstory of 1 Peter could basically be summarized in this phrase. Here it is. Suffering as a Gentile Christ follower. 
suffering as a Gentile Christ follower. In verses 10 to 12, let me just read this to kind of uh, set the table for some other things, but also to, to show you a bit of what I'm talking about. In 1 Peter, beginning with chapter 1, verse 10, picking up where we left off last week, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. What we find Peter doing, and, and let me back up just a second. What we learn in this book, obviously written by Peter, uh, it, it seems a bit odd what we know about Peter and his ministry in the early church to think of him writing primarily to a Gentile audience. Peter, in the book of Acts, is primarily the apostle that we associate with the Jews. Paul is the apostle that we more closely understand as being the apostle who ministered primarily to the Gentiles. But as we look closely into this book, we're going to see uh, how Peter goes about this. And he does it in a really clever and odd way. What he does is he refers constantly back to Jewish scriptures. Which you might think, well, that seems odd because these Gentile followers of Jesus are not going to have this as much into their background as perhaps those who grew up in the Jewish faith. But what's interesting about it is part of, and this is what's so clever about it, part of what he's doing is to help them deal with an issue that they were struggling with, and that is identifying with who they truly were in Christ. And what he's trying to do is to help them understand the connection that they have even with those those of the prophets in the Old Testament. He's trying to help them figure out how they fit into the bigger picture of God's family. It seems that part of these books were aimed to help them feel as if they were truly bona fide followers of Jesus. They were struggling with that. And they needed this because loyalty to Christ meant some very difficult circumstances in their life. We have no idea the extent of the, the hardship that these people endured because they were following Jesus. It affected literally every aspect of their lives. It affected their marriages because many of them found that one of the spouses had decided to become a Christ follower, and so that meant that now they were living in a home that was divided. And it all had to do with work environments. There was slavery going on at the time. And the biggest overarching situation that affected every aspect of life, much like it affects every aspect of our lives today, has to do with what's going on in the, in the background of the country. At this time in the first century, the idea of proclaiming that Jesus is Lord would get you killed. There was one Lord back in those days, and it was the Caesar. It was the ruler. And in fact, you worshipped the ruler. You worshipped him. And so to live as faithful followers of Jesus, to not have idols that were associated with what was going on within the government, to live a life that was truly that of following Jesus like we would understand it today was something that would bring about all kinds of, of literal and, and uh, psychological problems, emotional problems that made it really, really hard to live as followers of Jesus. Part of what you and I need to do is to take a step back and appreciate the, the dedication of these people. It's, it's the more I study it, the more I just am at awe. So that's part of the, that's, that's really who this book is written to. It's written to people who are experiencing extreme suffering because they have chosen to follow Jesus. Now, because we understand that, and as we understand the audience that he's writing this to, it then kind of helps us to understand a little bit better about his attack. What he's saying then is, 
He's, he's giving them what I'm calling a two-pronged uh, instructive emphasis. And the first of those prongs, prong number one, is this. Be holy. Be holy. And essentially what that means is he's saying to them, since you are reborn, stop acting like your ancestors. Since you are reborn, stop acting like your ancestors. Let me read to you this section. This is verses 13 to 21. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. One of the great sociological tragedies, realities, of the culture that we live in is something that is described as the cycle of poverty. Generational poverty. Are you familiar with those terms? Yeah. The cycle of poverty. See, poverty is more than, it's just simply not the lack of resources. Poverty is something that, if it's not addressed properly, can become what we call institutionalized. And part of what that means is that it repeats over and over and over, a cycle. And unfortunately, in much of our culture today, if you find yourself in a situation of poverty, there's a really high likelihood that you will continue to be in that situation. Sad. We can all see it. It's hard to know what to do about it. We see it, especially in certain environments. One of the places where we see poverty is in prisons. We see it in the inner city. We see it where there's a high uh, factor of drugs. We see it in schools. All kinds of places it shows up. And the reason I'm mentioning this to you because it relates a bit to what is going on with Peter as he's writing to these believers. And essentially what he's telling them to do is to step away from a cycle that you are familiar with through your ancestors. You are living in a culture that is a certain way and you need to step away from it in order for you to faithfully live for Christ, which asks, I think begs the question, well, okay, how do I do that? And one of the ways that I would suggest that we need to do this is a way that I heard described not too long ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, I have a, a brother, his name is Bill, and he also is in the ministry. Uh, he currently is a professor at Nebraska Christian College, and he also is involved in a ministry in the inner city of Lincoln, Nebraska, where he and his wife Marcia make their home, called Jacob's Well. Their son, my nephew, Mark, actually started this ministry. And it's uh, uh, recently he was uh, doing a radio interview talking about Jacob's Well. And I heard him say something that, I, that really, I think, bears you and I hearing again. Basically, what he was talking about, the ministry of Jacob's Well, and, and Jacob's Well is a ministry like many ministries. What they do is they provide all kinds of resources for people who are basically resource poor. They don't have access to the kinds of, of whether it's food or whether it's shelter or whether it's just basic things that we often take for granted. 
Anyway, one of the things that when he was asked about this, he said is that what ministries like Jacob's Well try to do is that they try to deal with the noise that's going on in people's heads. You see, for most of us, for me, I can tell you this, I have not given a thought to what I'm going to eat today. I haven't thought about it at all. I haven't thought about where I'm going to sleep. I haven't thought, about, you know, am I going to have clothing? Am I going to have gas in the car? Am I going to have a car? These are thoughts I never even, I, I, I never entertain these thoughts. It's just assumed. I, I have these things. And I have the ability to use them. But many people don't. And so what's going on in those situations is that playing in their heads is what he was describing like noise. It's, a, it's kind of this dullness, you know, that's there. That enables you to be distracted. It, it keeps you from really being able to focus on other types of things. And what Jacob's well tries to do is to essentially address some of the factors which create that noise. Like whether it's food or whether it's utilities or whether it's fellowship, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever it is. To try to just, you know, deal with some of those issues to quiet the noise that's going on in people's heads so then they can start hearing the message of Jesus. It's hard, uh, missionaries have been saying this for a long time. It's hard for someone to really understand the bread of life when their stomach is growling. You know, it's, you know we, we need to make sure that, that we understand that the gospel is more than what we sometimes think. And so uh, that's what ministries like Jacob's Well are about. Now, it is to this kind of cycle, again, that Peter is speaking when he talks about these Jewish references. He incorporates so many different Jewish references with these Gentile followers to help them understand where they fit into God's plans. And the point that he's making here with, with particularly the prophets is he's saying is the prophets when they were, were hearing these prophecies and as they were writing down these prophecies and making these prophecies, they wondered when this was going to happen. And they never got to see it. They did not. Even though they were the prophets of God, they never got to experience firsthand. And what Jesus is, or what Peter is saying to these Gentile followers is, it was for you that these things have happened. They were called. You were called. They were called in Leviticus chapter 11, be holy. You be holy. And throughout the book, Peter is going to deal with the noise these Gentile followers are experiencing. Don't be like your ancestors. You are not to be like your ancestors. You have a new father. And his point is, since you have been reborn, you need to act not like who you were, but like who you, in fact, are. Peter is going to get really into this in the section of Scripture we're going to look at more closely in a couple of weeks. But for right now, prong one, be holy since you are reborn, stop acting like your ancestors. We need to break this cycle of, of spiritual poverty that's going on. On the back of your outline then, let's look at prong two. Prong two, use the hope of the resurrection to take love to the extreme. Use the hope of the resurrection to take love to the extreme. I want you to look at verse 22 with me. This is you talk about clever. This is, this is brilliant, what Peter has written here. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. A simple sentence, right? Yes. But as we look closer at the words, we discover that Peter is, is speaking in a very powerful and incredible truth. What he's saying is that being reborn creates the possibility for us to experience love in a different way. And, and what is interesting about it, he, he calls it love more deeply, love from a pure heart, are some of the different translations of how he describes this. He actually uses language here that to us, we can't pick it up because we don't really, we're not reading this in the Greek. 
because he uses love. Notice how he uses the word love twice. Yeah, love for each other and love one another deeply. Same word, same idea, right? No, absolutely not, as we're going to discover. Peter uses language both of intensity and type when speaking of how they should treat each other. First, the first instance that we see here is because you are, you've been purified, because you've been reborn, he talks about how that uh, we are to treat each other, have a love for each other. And the word there in the Greek is actually, should be a familiar word to it to us. It is the word Philadelphos. You've heard of Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love. Yeah, we get that. Yeah, that's the word that he uses. A sincere Philadelphia, Philadelphos. Yes. But then... Here's where it gets clever. Here's where it, it, we really start to see what he's talking about. Then he instructs them to intensify their affection to what he calls a deep love. And the word love here has changed. The word now is agape. And we've talked about this at different times. Agape is the highest form of love that we understand. It was that that was associated more with a selflessness, uh, it, it included a mutuality, but more of a selfless kind of love given to us by God that we share with other people. So why did he do this? What's going on here? Well, let me suggest to you there's a couple of critical points that he's making. Peter uses language both of intensity and type when speaking of how they, followers, Gentile followers of Jesus, should treat each other. And he's making two critical points. Here's point number one. Are you ready? Here we go. Point number one. Being reborn, which came from rhema of God. The rhema of God is what enables intensified love. What? Rhema? What are you talking about? What, is, what, what are you talking about? Well, actually what Peter does in the verses that you'll notice in the outline, verses 24 and 25 of 1 Peter, 2, or 1 Peter 1, he says, he's actually quoting, sort of, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8, where it says, All people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Now, the, the reason I say sort of, it was sort of, uh, quoting uh, Isaiah chapter 40 is because Peter changes one word in that uh, translation from Isaiah. In Isaiah, uh, and, and again, it's one of those things that if, in, unless you understand the original languages, you're not going to see this. Uh, verse 25, but the, but the word of the Lord, the rhema, the word, the word rhema actually means word or utterances of God. The utterance of God, the word of the Lord, endures forever. And this is the rhema, the, the utterances that was preached to you. Now, what's going on here is that in, in most of the instances when we come across the word word in the scripture, it's the word logos. Uh, in the beginning was the word, logos. It's talking about that concept. And it's referring to God, it's referring to the scriptures, it's referring to lots of different things. But the point, listen, the point that Peter is making is, you Gentiles have been reborn, and the rebirth that you have received has come by hearing the gospel, the utterances of God. In other words, the prophets heard the, the logos of God, if you will. You are hearing the rhema of God, if you will. And he is associating those two things things together. He is saying that the gospel is the same as. It's, it has the same effect and it's accomplishing the same things. And what he's saying, first of all, is to reaffirm who you are in him. So first of all, being reborn comes from this utterance of God that you yourselves have received. How did they find out and become reborn? It was through the gospel. The gospel that was preached. The utterances of God as we see. Then secondly, here's the second part. Second, this intensified love, the virtue of love, will be necessary for us to thrive in this world. 
We are going to need this love if we're going to thrive in the world. Have you discovered, <laughs> have you discovered that there are some people who are difficult to love? Have you figured that out yet? Yes. Well, let me, let me drill down just a little bit more, okay? Have you discovered that there are some Christians who are pretty hard to love too? For those of you at home, the limited number of people in the audience are shaking their heads right now. Yes. Yeah, the idea that there are followers of Jesus who are difficult to love. Hmm. Which I think begs the question, what do we do with people like that? How are we supposed to treat people like that? Often what we see happening and often what we actually hear people talking about is the building of protective walls. So essentially what we try to do is to build barriers so that those people, whoever they might be in our mind, they can't hurt us. We, we, we just won't allow that to happen and we figure out ways that that can happen. Some other consequences that go along with that, and I would invite you to remember what we said to the children just a few moments ago, that oftentimes we find hesitation, we find fear, we find doubt. But what I want to suggest to you this morning, in fact, I, I want to say to a congregation who I think has a really good sense of what it means to love one another, I think we need to hear that the message of hope is prepared and able to take the love that we have for one another to an infinitely higher level. A level where when it is fully formed, when hope is fully formed, will create environments where we will not flinch, where we will not hold back, where we are prepared to even experience pain in the relationships that we have with other people, and the gain that we experience from that is knowing that we have been faithful to our God and that the future for us is sure and it, it enables us to do something that's even difficult, something painful. Again, I, I hear many Christ followers drawing boundaries. Cut off those people in your life, even if they're Christ followers, who, you know, who are negative or are this, that, or the other. I don't think that's what the gospel's saying. In fact, what it is saying is that we are to intensify our efforts. It's funny, I never see a scripture reference to those kinds of thoughts. There's never one given. That's weird that you would think if, it is, if that's the truth, that there would be some reference that could be used to back it up. I don't think uh, God, many people think, I don't think God is dealing me or leading me into dealings with endangered or abusive people. I would suggest exactly the opposite. I think God is leading us into relationships with especially followers of Jesus who have been damaged and who have been abused so that the love of God can be shown to them and help them to be restored so they can also share it. And what a powerful testimony that will be to the world. That this love thing of God is real and powerful. And what enables us to do that, listen, what enables us to do that is the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus. What causes us to flinch is because we wonder, will it be worth it? And what the resurrection of Jesus, the hope that we get from that says, yes, it will be worth it. To the extent that you suffer, you'll be glorified. To the extent that you're persecuted, you'll be glorified. That's the hope we have in the resurrection of Jesus. And so let me conclude this morning by saying something that I think is really obvious. You know, loving the lovable is really easy. It's easy to love lovable people. But if you really want to show the love of God, if you really want, if you really want to see that, that level of God's love intensified in your life, then reach out to those who are not lovable. Reach out to the ugly Reach out to the annoying. Reach out to the naive. Reach out to the troubled. 
I can tell you this, that they will flinch from you at first glance because they are not expecting that from you. They are expecting more abuse, more problem, more struggle, because that's what they've had a steady diet of in their lives. And many people who have even experienced God to some extent and have come to churches have left those churches because the talk that we talk about love really only applies to certain people and not to all in the fellowship of the body of Christ. Hope. Listen, hope provides a rock-solid foundation which enables me to be fearless in my following of God's Spirit and His leading in my life. And I can tell you this without, without hesitation, friend, that the Spirit of God, if you're following the Spirit of God, you will be called, you will be led, you will be directed into the lives of those people who need your love for them in the name of Jesus. And many of them will be troubled, annoying, hurt, difficult people. Let me suggest to you one of the ways that you can approach that with a bit of a greater sense of ease is by realizing, I hope you can still realize this, that before you came to Christ, before I came to Christ, we were helpless and we were annoying and we were dirty and worthless but we've been reborn. The Spirit is calling us. He's instructing us. He's, listen, He's assuring us. And so let us, let the the virtue of hope ooze from us in the area of love. As we love one another, may that intensify exponentially as we encounter people who are difficult and hard to love. Wow, God has really placed it on us, hasn't he? I mean, he is, this is the power of the resurrection though. And I just want to challenge you and I want to challenge myself to remain humble in him to know his purpose in our lives. Let's pray for one another right now. Would you pray with me? And now, Father, we're grateful today that we can gather in the name of Jesus to, uh, to just celebrate your goodness. We're grateful, Father, for the resurrection that we celebrate and the hope that we have in it. And especially as we've been talking about how it, uh, how it affects um, the love that we share one for another. Father, I pray that we would recognize the patterns of poverty, of spiritual poverty in our lives that keep us from hearing your message, that, that create noise. And I pray that we would not um, diminish the legitimacy of your word in secular ways by saying, well, that's not really what he means. He can't mean that. When over and over you remind us that that's exactly what you mean. Help us, Father. Just help us to not be satisfied with the level of love that we see in our lives, but to take it to another level. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, Peyton is going to come and lead us in a time of decision. And I would invite that if you have a decision to make for Jesus to come now as she leads us. Please stand. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can say. So let us pray as we go forward. 
And now, Father, as we leave this place today, as we conclude this service, we pray that your word would find fertile ground within our hearts, that we would see those places where we need to repent and confess, where we need to submit ourselves more to you, that we would continue to grow strong in your presence. And we thank you for your faithful witness, even in difficult days like now. And so may we uh, be faithful to you this week and every day until you call us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.